Good evening to everybody. Uh, normally, I would allow members' questions and public questions to continue. However, tonight we have a very full agenda uh, of business that we have to get through, which is followed by a special executive meeting at 2030. As the latter is also a public meeting, it must start on time. When scheduled, it was not known that there would be seven public questions and 13 member questions. With all the best will in the world, they will not all be answered within the meeting and written answers will need to be issued. You can help by asking your question quickly, not having a supplementary or if you have a supplementary, it should be brief to the point and relevant to the original question. Before I start the formal meeting, I would like to remind members who have returned to politics with a vengeance as usual, that we're still in an emergency, which is being run concurrently with recovery. Please be mindful of uh, resources. Uh, we only have a finite uh, amount of, of um, officer resources. So if you're, if you're calling for officer resources, it means that they aren't doing something else. Coronavirus is still a very real threat and danger. So please be vigilant, observe the social distancing regime, the face masks, protocols and other guidance. After having said that, welcome to the meeting and um, let me come to the agenda, which is apologies for absence. Anne. Chairman, there are apologies from Councillor Charles Margetts. Thank you. Um, 9 to 30, uh, the minutes of the previous meetings. Anybody, um, anything to say now? Um, we, we'll vote by um, raising hands. Uh, I think that's very quick and succinct. So are you all happy with the minutes of the previous meetings? Please raise your hands. Yep, lovely. Um, can I have a proposer and a seconder? I'll propose them, John. I'll second it, John. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, declarations of interest. Um, I'd like to de declare an interest in uh, the companies, uh, a personal interest. I received no, no, no remuneration for sitting on the holding company board. Perry? Perry? Yes. Your hands up. Sorry, I have lowered it, but it's still showing. My apologies. Ola Corin. I am declaring an interest in item six because I am an unpaid non executive director of London Homes. Stuart? Like, likewise, I'm declaring interest as a, a non-paid executive uh, director of the uh, holding company. John? Yes, I am also declaring the same. OK, any other interests? No, fine. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, John. Wayne? Sorry, yeah, same for me, holding company. Thank you. Uh, now go, coming to public question time, Philip Chalice, could you make yourself known, turn on your video and ask your question please. Philip Chalice, is Philip Chalice here? Chairman, I don't believe he is in attendance. Uh, what, what should I do, just give a written answer? It will be a written answer, Chairman. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Meyer, I, I saw you there. Whoops, sorry, I appear to be having te technical difficulties. There we go. You should be able to see me now, can you? I can see you absolutely wonderfully. Thank you very and, much. And hear me too, I Yes. Okay, indeed. perfect. Thank you. So um, my question is, following your social media posts incorrectly linking Black Lives Matter with the atrocious killings in Forbury Gardens, do you accept that you've destroyed the trust and confidence of black and anti-racist residents and staff in Wakingham Borough Council? 
failing in your duty to foster good relations, and some would say inflaming racial division. As a result, will you be considering your position? Thank you. Question, Elizabeth. I was as shocked and disgusted. Um, could you just uh, mute yourself or Alan Winter mute himself? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Elizabeth. I was as shocked and disgusted at the killing of George Floyd as any other right-thinking person. And it is my sincere hope that the world can change for the better as a result of the outcry it has produced. I completely support the message, principles, and the aims of Black Lives Matter in the UK. I have always been opposed to discrimination in all its forms. I understand the need today to have a clear focus of tackling racism wherever it is found. The senseless stabbings in Forbury Gardens underline the fragility of life. One of the victims was a very popular Holt teacher, James Furlong. It is difficult to find words to console in such dreadful circumstance. It is impossible to understand the motive for such actions. None of my social media posts have linked Black Lives Matter with the killings in Forbury Gardens. In case there was any possibility of mistaken conflation, I posted a clarification immediately, which stated, I would like to make it clear that there is no suggestion that the Black Lives Matter march that afternoon had anything to do with what has now been described as a terrorist incident. Wokeing Borough Council is anti-racist, promotes equality and celebrates diversity. We are determined to do better to ensure that every resident in the borough feels truly valued. It will continue to do so whilst I am leader. We are undertaking a survey with our communities to listen to anybody who has experienced racism in any form, as well as anybody with views on how this issue can be tackled. In particular, the importance that Black Lives Matter it is deliberately an open listening exercise that acknowledges there will be problems we have not seen and answers we have not thought of. The survey is open throughout July and August and I urge everybody to take part. I will not be reconsidering my position. This is an important community issue and I will continue to lead the council on behalf of the communities, working with the independent BME forum and listening to staff and residents on their views on this vitally important issue. Working with council officers, I will address the inequalities that I identified and I determinedly take it forward our ongoing quest for community cohesion. If any comments I have made have been offensive to anyone, I apologize unreservedly, but that was never my intention. Rather by reaching out, I hope to bring residents together. I fully support Nelson Mandela, who said, I detest racialism because I regard it as a bar barbaric thing whether it comes from a black or a white man. Do you have a supplementary, Elizabeth? I do, yes. Um, so thank you for your answer. Um, sadly, your answer and, and the things you say on equality feel pretty insincere and, and scripted. Um, apart from your comments at the previous council meeting saying that you wouldn't support Black Lives Matter and the social media post, which you actually apologised for in Wokingham today on the 25th of June, um, acknowledging that what you did was an entire mistake. I've done damage to myself and the council. Um, these things seem to reflect genuine sentiments a little more than the than, than the uh, answer you've given. Uh, the fact that you still believe Black Lives Matter is about George, George Floyd's death shows your lack of understanding or knowledge about the human rights movement, which was actually founded in 2013. Elizabeth, must be a as, Yes, as a leader of the council, which is apparently hardwired to promote equality, if you're not prepared to reconsider your position, what steps and commitment are you prepared to make today to better educate yourself and your fellow councillors on these crucial and sensitive matters to ensure your behaviour doesn't contravene the councillor's code of conduct again. Uh, Elizabeth, I, I don't think that make it. Sorry, you're, uh, I think you're, you're echoing again. I don't believe that my... 
I don't believe my conduct has uh, contravened the Council uh, Code of Conduct nor the Nolan Principles. Uh, I believe the, that is, uh, there is a, a another agenda. But I, I reiterate where we are. Uh, as, a, as a council, we are anti-racist, we promote equality and celebrate diversity. And we will do our very best to make that happen. Thank you. But, but that doesn't actually answer the question. May I ask what you're going to do to, to breach that? Um, as I mentioned, 9.2.8.7, councillors must not do anything which may cause their council to breach any of the equality enactments as defined in the Equality Act 2010. Um, I feel your actions have very much done that. So I think there needs to be some commitments undertaken to ensure that doesn't happen again. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think you've had your separate question. Thank you. Can I now ask Beth Rowland? Um, her question to John Kaiser, please. Beth doesn't seem to be in the meeting, Chairman. Okay. So then can we go to Carol Jewell? Is there a Carol Jewell? Carol Jewell doesn't appear to be in the meeting either. Okay. <laughs> um, then uh, James Vivian Robinson. Yes, he, he does I'm sound... Here. Yes, I'm here, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what you, action... Yeah. Sorry? Fire away. OK. What action is the council executive going to take to rectify the A33 new surface road noise, bearing in mind the severe and life changing impact the increased noise is having on the mental health and well-being of local residents? Thank you for your question, uh, Mr Vivian Robertson. Um, the council has commissioned WSP, who are a specialist consultancy, to investigate the noise levels along the A33 corridor and to look at what measures are required to effectively mitigate the impact on local residents. The final report is expected to be issued to the Council by WSP in September, which will allow the Council to take a decision on the way forward during October. Do you have a, suppl uh, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, I do. Um, thank you for that response. October sounds rather late to me, but uh, we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in due course. My question is, Bearing in mind the executive's decision to use this new surface, are the executive therefore going to take full responsibility and liability for the impact the increased noise will have on residents? I can tell you that whatever WSP conclude in their review, we will take the appropriate action. So you're going to take responsibility then? We're taking responsibility for the result of the WSP review, whatever that is. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Colin Brook. Is there a Colin Brook? Yeah. Far away. Fine. <laughs> Video Thank on, please. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is in respect of the resurfacing of the A33 bypass near the village of Risley. Please can you explain the criteria used in the decision-making process? I am interested to understand if the decision was purely financial, purely financial, or if the increase in environmental noise pollution, impact on health, well-being, and the enjoyment of local residents, or the potential devaluation of property and subsequent equity, negative equity, were included in the process, or were these completely overlooked and ignored? Thank you for your question. Um, the Council manages the Working Highways Network in accordance with UK Pavement Management System recommendations. This is recognised by central government and the wider industry through its code of practice as national standard for well-maintained and well-managed highway infrastructure. It's this system that establishes through technical survey data what parts of the network are prioritised for maintenance and what kind of resurfacing treatments are appropriate for each location. Like most other, most other highways authorities, Working and Borough Council makes use of materials such as micro-asphalt and surface dressing to extend the lifespan 
of the road network before it requires a more expensive full resurfacing treatment. The full life expectancy of the new plain and inlay HRA road is up, up, of up to 20 years is usually only achieved through the application of a surface dressing or marker asphalt treatment after eight to 10 years. So it's quite a normal practice to do that. All these materials are of course approved by the Highways Authority Product Approval Scheme, HAPAS, which it was developed by market experts to offer consistent and clear testing methods for products and systems designed for use by the highways industry. In addition, both, both micro asphalt and surface dressing treatments benefit from having low carbon footprint, they're quick to apply, which means less disruption to road users, residents, local businesses and the emergency services. Lock chip, which was used on the recent resurfacing works on the A33, is a type of surface dressing and differs from the conventional surface dressing in that a further layer of bituminous emulsion, which is very difficult to say, is sprayed over the top of loose stone. As a consequence, lock chip generally has a smoother surface with less loose material and looks more like new tarmac. Whilst these kinds of treatment do not last as long as full resurfacing treatment, such as plain and inlay HRA scheme, they are very cost effective and important component of the maintenance of Workingham's Highways Network. It is worth noting that full plain and in inlay HRA scheme on the recently resurfaced section of the A33 would have cost 1.3 million as opposed to 200,000 for lock chip. That said, the council has commissioned WSP, as I said before, to investigate the no noise levels along the A33 and look into what measures might be required to effectively mitigate the impact on local residents. The final report is expected, as I said, in September, which will allow the council to take a decision on the way forward in October. So the answer is what we're doing is quite standard, but we will look at the impact on local residents and take the appropriate action. Uh, thank you. Could I ask a, a, a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, could you please explain what uh, change in policy has, in, has occurred since the resurfacing of phases one and two of the A33 in a much smoother and almost quiet material? Uh, thank that you. Was, for that was used by your department yeah. uh, a few years ago. Thank uh, you. Could you answer using a like for like com comparable, please? I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to get you a written answer to that um, because the the previous resurfacing was before my time as highways executive, and I don't know why they used what they did then versus what they do now, but I'll certainly get you a written answer. Uh, Thank you very much. Could, could you give me a timetable? Thank you. I'll get you one as soon as I can. So I'll ask highways officers the minute I get off the phone. Or Thank off you. The screen. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank Alan you. Winter. Alan Winter? Yes, can you, can you hear me? I can't... Uh, can't see you or anybody else because of some technical issue but um, um, yeah I'd like to ask the executive member for environment and leisure um, a question please um, in agenda my agenda item eight you've described the proposed new recycling sacks as being made of hessian could you please reassure residents who are concerned about the environmental impact of this and guarantee that the Hessian bags will be made of natural recyclable material and not actually be made of plastic? Thank you, Alan, uh, and a very good evening to you. Uh, and thank you for your question. And I can confirm, Alan, that uh, these types of sacks ha have been generically uh, called Hessian, but in fact, uh, are made from woven polypropylene fibre with a light plastic coating to ensure resistance to moisture. They are though reusable and can last up to five years uh, and so uh, they are not a, a single plastic use. We will though uh, be investigating the possibility of having them recycled when they are no longer usable. Do you have a supplementary? Um, yes, I, I, I will, please. Um, so basically, um, they're not Hessian, which is of a natural no, material. No. Um, they are made of polypropylene. Poly, polypropylene. So um, two points, really. First of all, can we can you stop using the term Hessian bags? Because that is uh, entirely misleading and wrong. Uh, and secondly, um, you know, the use of continued use of plastic sacks within this is very disappointing, given last week's council motion on uh, trying to reduce the use of plastics by the council. 
Can I ask, has the level of carbon emissions from the sacks been considered in the decision to change the sacks rather than boxes? And has that or has that decision been purely about saving money? Question number one. Uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I have asked uh, for the, the word Hessian to be removed from all the publicity material uh, in, in the going future. And uh, these these bags are only sort of there's a small amount of plastic used that's on the outside to keep uh, keep the moisture out, and that's the, the the sole intention is is to actually keep our paper and card dry, so that um, because wet waste uh, gets rejected and it costs us a lot of money to actually process, and uh, these bags are uh, not really plastic; they are polypropylene and of course um, the uh, the question that you asked uh, uh, was it was it about the carbon emissions did you say uh, can you just repeat that for well, me has, has any consideration been made between the, the kind of carbon emissions that come from the production of and use of black well, as I say, compared to part. the carbon emissions that will come from this woven polypropylene bags no they, they, these are hard, there's hardly any plastic in there Alan and um, uh, they no, are we're, talk there. we're talking about polypropylene, which is a, a, a non-recyclable material. It's not Hessian. It's not natural. It's it's human made. Well, I'm advised that uh, we will be looking at uh, and inve investigate the possibility of having them recycled when they are no longer used. Thank you very much for your question. OK, thank you. Um, Coming to the next agenda item, the members' question time. Um, I will. I will. We will not get through all the members' questions unless uh, something remarkable happens. But I'll run it for as long as possible to not endanger the special counsel executive. Michael. Michael Firmiger. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. My question is to the Executive Member for the Environment and Leisure. What can we do to lift the arts and culture strategy to help lift Woking and Borough out of the coronavirus emergency? Uh, many thanks uh, again, Councillor Fermiger, for your question. And, I, and as, as you know, uh, I'm a great supporter of arts and culture and I'm really pleased that we now have a strategy that not only seeks to develop and promote our local culture, cultural offer, but also highlights the many ways in which social and economic well-being. Uh, whilst the panda pandemic uh, has uh, sadly curtailed pretty well all live events, performances and attendances at uh, uh, cultural venues, the amount of online content that has been made available and widely accessed pays testimony to the importance of arts and culture to all our lives and identities. Particularly in lockdown, we have seen how valuable arts and culture in, is in supporting people's mental health and well-being, providing connection and stimulation and reducing social isolation. Many have uh, also taken the opportunity to develop their own creative talents from baking, and hence we ran out of uh, uh, flour, uh, painting, writing and making things. I would hope that this renewed appetite for arts and culture will continue and that when conditions allow more engagement, people uh, will respond to our consultation on the strategy and help us to grow an a, a even more dynamic, accessible and excitable, exciting uh, cultural offer uh, <clears throat> across, across the borough. As the uh, severity of the lockdown eases and performances, community events, carnivals, events, uh, in libraries and other value, uh, value venues are all once again possible. This would be a great way to uh, draw people out of their homes and encourage them to embrace as well uh, as contribute to the arts and cultural activities on their doorstep. Do you have a supplementary, Michael? Um, no, I haven't. I'd just like to really share my uh, strong um, support of the arts and culture and thank the executive member for that full and very positive answer. Thank you very much. Um, Paul Fishwick. Thank you, John. Uh, my question is to the executive member for Environment and Leisure. 
There have been a number of street trees that have been removed but not replaced in the last few years. And in many cases, the verge is wide enough and conditions suitable to enable replacements to be planted. Woking and Borough Council does not have a tree <coughs> replacement policy but has planted new trees elsewhere. The loss of these trees has changed the street scene, making it look more urban. Will the council ensure that street trees are replaced wherever feasibly possible, including locations where trees have been lost in the last five years? Thank you. Uh, thank you um, <clears throat> for your question. Uh, that's very kind. Uh, the council acknowledges the importance of street uh, trees in softening the urban street site scene and has ensured that the provision of street trees in an in integral part of the, the designs for the major new roads we are building as part of the, the SDLs. Uh, whilst we do not uh, currently have a policy on uh, replacing the loss of ex uh, existing street trees, it is worth noting that it is very rare for the council to agree to the removal of street trees for anything other than health and safety grounds. In the event that a street tree must be removed uh, for health and safety reasons, the decision on whether part, uh, whether to plant a whether to plant a replacement tree is taken on a case by case basis. The council is in the process of developing a tree strategy and it is likely that this document will establish policies that will identify areas with existing va <coughs> valuable tree spaces, uh, identify areas that could be improved by tree planting and guide our, our decisions on the replacement of lost uh, street trees. The development of the tree strategy will of course include a public consultation uh, with residents and we would welcome your personal input into that process. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your response. Um, we're really looking at the um, existing areas at the moment rather than the SDLs, but would you please confirm that a planting schedule will commence as soon as possible and hopefully by this forthcoming planting season, autumn, winter, and try and aim for about 75% loss of trees uh, where feasible that would be planted this season? I totally wholeheartedly agree there with you um, and, and, and I very much hope that, that, that what you're suggesting will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Rochelle, please. Okay. Uh, my question is to the executive member for planning and enforcement, Wayne. Uh, when are you planning to restart the local plan update committee since Graysley is no longer viable without DCLG funding? This is according to a statement by the housing executive, Mr. Kaiser, at an executive meeting earlier last year. And most of the other sources are not available due to the spending on the pandemic and its aftermath. Evening, Rochelle. Hope you're well. Um, yes, as part of the local plan process update, we commissioned growth scenarios, and I will send you the link. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you know you know where they are, but I will send you the link. But in particular, we considered viability on page 103. More detailed analysis of Graysley and the scenarios also indicated that for both the 10,000 and the 15,000 unit tests, the initial phase is indicated a loss. Large, largely due to the timing of investment needed in the upfront utilities infrastructure. The next, the next point was on page 7.710 of page 103. Both these out, outcomes indicated a strong case for early investment to secure housing delivery. This highlights the importance of the contribution for the HIF, which is the Housing Infrastructure Fund, in securing the planning and the delivery of new homes. Graysley is therefore not an unviable proposition, rather than its heavily forwarded funding burden, which would have been lifted if we were successful in the Housing Infrastructure Fund and the bid that we put in. In reply to our bid on the 10th of March 2019, MHCLG commented that Wokingham bid was an ambitious proposal in an area of high housing demand. However, 
Following due diligence, the bid was found not to meet the gateway criteria, specifically on demonstrating significant market failure to require capital investment from the government. Most of the infrastructure could be funded by means, if, for example, if, sorry, if for example it was successfully delivered with the bid out of development or using loan finance. In essence, the government's review has confirmed the viability of Graysley, but suggests a different delivery model to what which was selected uh, and supporting our preferred option. In their reply, MHCLG drew attention to the proposed Single Housing Infrastructure Fund as a potential supporting mechanism for us. Full details of that have yet to be announced. We therefore are considering these options and the factors, as well as the responses we've received to the consultation. As soon as we have a clear picture, the Planning and Transport Policy Member Working Group will resume, and I'm sure you'll be part of that as you were before. Sorry. You, do you have a supplementary? Of Michelle? course I do. <laughs> MCLG is also proposing that the OAN, uh, better known as housing, our housing numbers that we require to build, will be changed in the uh, late autumn. We don't seem to know whether it'll be raised or lowered, considering the government has said that they want to uh, raise the number of houses built throughout the country. Um, what, how will we take this into account when we're doing the local plan update? Right, that's a very good question. And I can assure you that the team of all members that you will know um, have constant conversations with MHCLG. And also we will be testing because if they do come back to us with a higher number, as you know before in our due diligence of using a well-known barrister and a demographer, we will be testing anything they put forward to us to make sure that it, it works for us and not just for government. Thank as you, Wayne. you know, Rachel. Yes, you know. thank you, Wayne. You still owe me a drink, by the way. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I, 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 I think you had the supplementary question, Rochelle. Drinking is uh, ruled out. Not allowed. <laughs> yeah. No, he owes me a drink from the uh, the consultation that didn't happen, that consultation and the results. Oh, fair enough. Um, Gary. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, John. Um, my question is, from time to time, I see planning applications uh, with officers' recommendations approving the removal of trees, while other planning applications approve increased traffic on already busy roads. Uh, my question is regard to the council flagship policy on climate emergency. Which specific, what specific directions has the council given to its planning, environment, and highway departments to take climate emergency into consideration when dealing with all planning applications? Thank you. Evening, Gary. Evening, Wayne. Planning policy is designed to help decision makers balance competing objectives, such as protecting our environment and making new places for our people to live and work from. Our existing core strategy and management development delivery local plans to 2026, as, as obviously you know. Embedded sound planning policies to help us make decisions, and mitigate change for infrastructure investment and other measures. Managing change in the public interest will inevitably lead to some very difficult decisions made around traffic and landscaping as part of that balance. Climate change affects us all and our communities, and as they grow, the tensions you refer to will remain, and we would need to carefully manage those. Policy within the new local plan will require developments to provide adequate landscapes and biodiversity gain, as well as improved environmental performance, with major residential developments being designed to achieve carbon neutral homes. A subsequent supplementary planning document, the SPD, will also be developed to provide additional detail on how development of all types is expected to demonstrate the achievement of the policy requirements, including carbon neutrality. As with the previous plan, the new plan will establish a spatial strategy that allows us for that allows for more people to choose to live and work where journeys can be undertaken in a way that do not add to climate change and ensure 
connectivity to allow working from home, enabling our residents to make a choice for healthier and more environmentally sensitive options, such as walking, cycling for shorter journeys, including links to facilities such as using local buses and train stations will help our collective commitments address the climate change agenda. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wayne, for that. Um, the question was really dealing with, uh, with more and now than tomorrow. Uh, the Council has committed 50 million to fight climate change and it's also opposed to Heathrow Airport expansion if it's detrimental to the environment and the council's carbon footprint. Yet Walking Borough Council planning guidelines are silent as, as we stand now on climate emergency. I see many examples where the environment plays second fiddle to uh, random development. I mean, the, the new local plan will need to be updated now to include climate emergency rules for the planning department to refer to as material considerations. Um, the climate emergency action plan on page three states, and I quote, this is a plan for right now and for the future. My question is, is what is being taken, uh, what action is taken right now to refuse planning applications that are detrimental to the environment and the council's carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, it's a very good point, and it's a point that you know, we're obviously cognizant that we need to get right. Equally, as you know, planning planning policies exist, and it's important, and hence the reason why we we did go with a draft plan earlier on this year that we get those updated. We will obviously look at all applications that come in, but the, obviously the larger ones are the bigger ones when it comes to carbon neutrality in terms of what can be done and what the council can actually do in terms of the fuel sources, localities, as you say, in order to make those. We, we are working on it. I mean, obviously it's, it, it is, it's not an easy fix. Having been in the energy industry all of my life, carbon neutrality isn't, isn't an easy one to achieve. And it is something that we are on constant dialogue, especially with Gregor and his team, to ensure that we, well, we achieve what we try to achieve. Well, achieve, achieve that what is important to us. But it's not an easy fix, Gary. I'm not at all saying that we can just change all our policies overnight. So every house is zero carbon. It's not going to happen that easily. But we are working on it and we have an agenda to get there. Um, and all those policies will update it once we get the final local plan through. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, hello, that was a bit echoey. Were you inviting me to speak there, John? Hello? Beth Rose, please. Sarah, not, not now. At the moment, Beth Rowland, please. Okay. Is she here? Beth Rowland. Beth Rowland. Nope. I'm sorry. Uh, she's she's muted. Beth Rowland, please unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to ask the question. Um, am I allowed to say standing in my name or do you want me to read it out? Um, I think um, you should read it out. I'm very willing to do that. <laughs> the enforced lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that a considerable portion of our residents will have been furloughed for all their jobs on 80% of their normal salary. Some will have lost their jobs altogether, and over the next few months, many more will be unemployed as companies are forced to stop trading. That means that many more of our residents and their families will be forced to live on benefits with the problems that brings to children and young people. Will this authority work with local charities and organisations, including Berkshire Credit Union, to support families living in poverty and debt? John John Kreiser. Good evening, Beth. 
Um, working in borough council is working closely with the third sectors to support residents in the borough. We're working with our residents, which include tenants, site dwellers, leaseholders and licensees and others at this difficult time. If, the, if, if as many are experiencing financial difficulties, um, we, will, we will actually work with them um, uh, we're, and struggling to pay their council tax or, or money that they owe to the council. We will work with them on an individual basis to understand their personal circumstances and come up with a, a sustainable payment plan for them. We are also we will also look at what they will be entitled to by to mean tested benefits to maximise their income, or they may even be able to apply for a discretionary housing payment, local welfare, or signpost them to access many of the great charities that were that are working in Wokingham. We also signpost to the following independent money and advice organisations such as National Debt, Money Advice Service, and and Step Change. Um, the the other issue is that um, we're, with at the moment we um, um, finally I guess even though the council is in step with the guidance of the CAB the councils uh, and the council tax protocol and the best practice which is agreed by the LGA it is but a short step for us to formally adopt that protocol and to indicate to our commit our commitment to our residents who require help. And as such, I will commit to signing the CAB Council Tax Pro Protocol Agreement as agreed with the LGA. That said, we will continually review our procedures to ensure that the best outcome is for all residents. Thank you very much, Beth. As you were late, I'm sorry I can't allow you the supplementary because we've run out of public question time. Sarah. Thank you. Uh, this is for you, John. Um, short and sweet. Do you acknowledge that poverty exists within the borough? Um, could whoever's uh, still on mute themselves, please, because it's um, echoing. Um, Wokey and Borough is one of the least deprived unitary authority areas in England. In fact, it ranked the least deprived in 2019. However, is all, in all cases, Wokingham Borough does have some pockets of deprivation and poverty, where households are living on low income and may have been there for many years. The Department for Work and Pensions estimate that around 7% of Wokingham Borough children, approximately 2,400 aged 16 and under, live in low income households compared to 15% in Great Britain, 8% in Bracknell Forest, and 7% in Windsor Bayhead, Maidenhead. We have a clear understanding of our demographic profile for the borough and of where our more vulnerable communities reside, including those who may be most affected by poverty. Nevertheless, we realise there is always more than we can do, and moreover, we want to do more to get a greater level of granular detail around the key poverty metrics to our understanding. The impact of COVID-19, for example, has seen that almost 18% of our workforce in Wokingham has been furloughed up to 31st of May 2020, compared to 24% over the UK as a whole. Naturally, some of these workers on the furlough scheme may experience subsequent issues which we need to understand, track and monitor. We aim to target our services to support these communities most in need for areas such as Norris, Finchhampstead South and some areas within Winnesh Ward. Since Wokingham Borough is one of the most affluent areas in the country, there is a significant gap between residents on low income compared to those on high incomes. Much of the work done by Wokingham Borough Council and its partners aims to bridge this gap, enable self-sustaining lifestyles for our vulnerable communities and offer targeted support. Working Borough Council is a member of the Berkshire Recovery Group, which is focusing on four priority themes, one of which relates to individual hardship, 
Hence, for a county perspective, there is a spotlight on this area and moreover, an agreed partnership approach to providing and supporting those communities facing hardship at this challenging time. It is also important to recognise that the Council itself is too suffering unprecedented financial challenges with declining balances. Therefore, we must be judicious in our approach to poverty, ensuring that we are truly focusing on those supporting, on supporting those most in need. Despite this, we're taking a passionate view approach with our council tax collections by contacting those residents who may be having difficulty with their payments, engaging with them to understand their individual circumstances and to proactively support them going forward. Beth, could you turn your camera off, please? Um, Sarah, do you have a supplementary? Thank you very much. A really detailed question, and and I appreciate that that you acknowledge. Obviously, there is a problem. Um, the difficulty with statistics, obviously, is it depends on what you're actually using as the unit of measurement. So, um, as an example, the um, End Child Poverty Charity, um, they measure um, poverty possibly in a different way because they've actually got, and the last time they took statistics, May 2019, 18.4% of our children in this borough actually live in relative poverty when you take housing costs into consideration, which is which is a huge number actually. And I think we have the issue that a lot of people assume we don't have that much of an issue because we are an affluent area, but that obviously makes the gap bigger, as you say. Um, we've had a problem for a long time. It's not just a COVID thing. Obviously COVID is going to make it worse. And the, the figures of poverty have been going up and up and up. And the fact that we have food banks and the food banks are increasing the number of people that they're, um, yes. they're there, dealing there, with. There, it's a question, not a... There is there is a question in here. There is a question in here, and I'm setting context. Thank you. Um, the point is, it's been increasing for a long time. It's set to increase further because of COVID, but it's been a problem for a long time. So what I'm struggling to understand and would like to know is whatever we've been doing as a council in the past hasn't been working because we've been increasing our levels of poverty, not decreasing. So what I'd like to know is what are we going to be doing now um, that's different to actually tackle this issue, not just in relation to COVID, but in relation to the fact that we've had we, we've had increasing poverty levels for, for years and years and years. Sorry, uh, I was waiting for, for you to finish. Um, what what are we going to be doing now, which is different? Because what we've been doing in the past hasn't worked. I don't know that it hasn't worked. Um, well, if poverty I, levels are increasing, have, then it hasn't worked. I will come back to you on that because uh, you are you are saying something which I don't know, uh, which is my understanding is that we have looked after our uh, the people that we need to look after in our borough, and it's our intention to do so. Um, we are a a very compassionate council, and trying to find the people who need the help, but. As I said in, in, in my my answer, we can only do so if we have the resources to do so. So we as a councillors are going to have face some very challenging conversations in ensuring those resources continue to exist. Thank you. Okay, I look forward to a written answer. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Mickleburg. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is to you um, as leader of the council. The fact that poverty is multidimensional and that some of its elements and manifestations are intangible are just two of the challenges that make poverty complex to measure and to track. Notwithstanding, it's vital that this is done in order to serve our residents, to help reduce numbers falling into poverty and to help lift others out of poverty and to ensure a timely, efficient and effective use of scarce resources. What processes and procedures are in place in our borough to ensure timely, meaningful and comprehensive data on poverty in all its manifestations, wherever it might exist in our community, is being collected and used to good effect? Thank you. There are a variety of data sources published nationally which we monitor to help identify the levels of poverty that exist within the borough. The published data also enables us to track how numbers are changing over time and allows us comparisons with neighbouring areas, regional and national trends. The Council regularly monitors all available data, data sources along with local intelligence and knowledge to effectively understand our communities and deliver 
the right services. Nevertheless, we realise that there is always more that we can do. And moreover, we wanted to get do more to get a greater level of granular detail around the key poverty metrics to our, aid our understanding. Our community engagement team, who work directly with our residents, have a good knowledge of the demographics within the borough. And through their local connections, understand and know residents and communities who may be more vulnerable and are able to plan and target their support work and initiatives to directly benefit those communities most in need. The council is also aware that many residents may be experiencing impacts to their finances during COVID-19. Nearly 18% of our workforce and working have been furloughed, as I said before, compared to 24% in the UK. Naturally, some of those workers may experience subsequent issues, which we need to understand, track and monitor. For those affected, households with lower incomes who traditionally operate on little or no savings, the impact of coronavirus and the risk of poverty could be greater. Therefore, maintaining our engagement with the communities is vital to, con to continue providing support. The Council has created a new directorate, Communities Insight and Change, with the remit of getting an improved bank of insight and data to drive more informed decisions. This will aid our strategic approach around areas we want to focus on as a priority, of which poverty is one. The, the, my previous answer outlines the Council's work at, at about Berkshire level. Now, Andrew, you can either have a supplementary or allow your colleague to ask the question, David Hare. You can't do both. If we can't do both, then I'll defer to David. Fire right away. David. Come in, David. I'm coming. Yes. Um, charities amongst the many organisations that, that are raising alarm about large numbers of people in all parts of the UK who are falling into poverty as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of these charities have also seen their own financial resources slashed and thus their ability to help people in need suffer as a result of the pandemic. What is WC's strategy for ensuring that local key charities engaged with tackling poverty in our borough will be able to meet the increased demand for vital services provided by charities despite the current funding crisis that some of these charities face? Thank you for the question, David. Not a bow tie tonight either. I, I have mentioned in my previous responses that we are uh, will be facing some severe financial challenges as the parlance goes. And those on the overview and scrutiny committee will be faced, as we will be faced, with some very unpalatable choices. We are certainly not going to be able to do everything. However, we have worked very closely with um, the charities in uh, the run up the, to the, the during the emergency and um, we have an organization which is now working very well in response to this guidance we have set up a service sustainability fund to support providers to maintain service continuity during this period of dealing with coronavirus the fund is administered through an application process for an additional retrospective funding. This fund has been promoted to all providers of adult services, including all those we contact within the voluntary and community sector. To qualify for reimbursement items of expenditure must be all the following. Related to clients in receipt of adult social care services that are funded by Woking Borough Council or related to self-funders within the Woking geographical area, over and above the usual finance, uh, business costs directly related to the coronavirus emergency in respect of actual payments made. Several VCS providers have requested and have received funding through this scheme, including Wade, Class, ASD Family Help, Age UK, Berkshire, Young People with Dementia and Ridgeline Trust. At the start of the outbreak, we set up a Wokium Borough community response to meet the needs of vulnerable residents due to COVID-19. This has been a joint 
working group with the VCS. The focus has also included supporting the VCS through this difficult period. We have many support we have supported the VCS to, to, to apply for grant applications. We've provided PPE for most many local voluntary organizations who have found it difficult to source reasonably priced PPE on their own. And we've provided advice and guidance via public health on understanding all the guidance issued. It is also important to recognize that the council itself is, too suffer is suffering unprecedented fi financial hardship with declining balances. Therefore, we must be judicious in our approach to poverty, ensuring we are truly focusing on supporting those most in need. Working Borough Council is a member of the Berkshire Recovery Group. Hence, for the county perspective, there is a spotlight. Thank you. I can just squeeze another question in if you want to, or you can uh, have a supplementary. I'll allow another question. Thank you. Bill. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question to the Executive Member for Finance and Housing, uh, John Kaiser. In view of the government announcement regarding recompense to assist local authorities in their shortfall in income at their leisure centres during the COVID-19 pandemic, will this grant assist the Council in any way, and if so, how? I think you're muted, John. John? John, 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 all your words are getting lost. You're muted. Sorry, sorry. Bear with me. Bill, on the assumption that you're referring to the 75p in the pound scheme, which the government will rec represent, um, rep represent um, the pr principal local authorities of 75% of lost income subject to a 5% threshold. It has been confirmed the council cannot claim for its lost two third party income, i.e. the support of places for leisure, but it is able to claim for any loss or foregoing management fee that was budgeted but not received. Details on how to claim are awaited, but, but the council will be aiming to recover as much of its lost income as permitted. The cost to the council as a result of the, the forced closure of our leisure centre is a big financial issue and we will continue to work with our leisure provider, work with other local authorities in a similar position and work with government departments to alleviate our costs and restore both the financial position for our council's taxpayers and the service provider for our community going forward. Thank you very much everybody. Uh, I, I, I apologise to um, Chris Bowering, uh, Andy Croy, Maria G, and Imogen, that, and um, Ive Jones. So they will have to uh, have written answers, but we've got further than I expected to. So thank you very much for playing the game, everybody. Thank you very much for those who forewent public que uh, uh, supplementary questions. Uh, now back to the agenda. Um, John Kaiser shareholders report. Okay, Chairman, before I go into the shareholders report, um, we've heard a lot about poverty tonight and there was questions with regards to how we're going to rebuild our reserves, which seem to be at odds. But I would just like to paint a picture as to why, how, in what uh, context I'm presenting the numbers going forward. I mean, let's make it very clear, everybody. Many of us have been in isolation and there's a war being waged across the globe, fighting COVID-19. And like in all wars, the main task is to protect your population and to prevail, no matter what the financial cost may be. If anybody believes this is an overstatement of the facts, here are the facts in the UK alone. 46,000 deaths, 1 1.4, one in every four workers furloughed. That's 9 million people. Government on target for spending 300 billion. They've spent 200 billion already. The USA have spent over 6 trillion so far with 150,000 people killed by this COVID-19. Now let's talk about Wokingham. Residents supported by the council has ballooned from 1,800 to near 5,000 people at its height. We have paid out £39.4 million in government grants and rate reliefs to businesses large and small. 
We're faced with an overall overspend this year of £19 million, but supported by grants and other payments of £15 million from the government and the NHS, as well as some other income. So if anybody here thinks this is not a disaster, the likes this generation has never seen or had to deal with, please, I urge you to contact me and I will expand on the upheaval, not just faced by us, but the industry, but industry and public service from councils to NHS. And largely, as we, although we plan for recovery, we are still not out of the woods yet, and nobody has any idea what normal will look like or cost. With spikes turning up across the UK and Europe, and the third world just beginning to fill the costs in lives and resources across the go grow the globe, I would say we're probably still in the early stages of this worldwide pandemic. And I hope that sets the scene for our numbers going forward. Now, if I just move on to the shareholders report. The shareholders report, this is for our housing companies. Um, there's not an awful lot to say here. Um, we are on target. It's reporting uh, the numbers. We are currently got 57 houses under construction. Um, the only thing that is worth note is that um, I actually, uh, at the earlier on in this year, um, I actually made the statement that what we would do is we would be building, trying to, or we a target, ambitious target to build a thousand homes over four years, uh, a mixture of homes at which we would produce a return, an overall return of five percent. And to achieve this, it was agreed we'd move to a more efficient and effective one-team approach between the council and the housing company. And we're bringing in the development function of the housing company back in-house. And I must say, that's beginning to work quite successfully. The numbers are there for you to see. They're on budget. As you can see, there is a loss in WBC, but we're expecting a full year uh, profit of about £400,000 from the two other companies after taking the loss of WHO out. And that will mean that will go straight into the, um, the general fund. Are there any questions? Any, any questions? From any member of the executive, um, then could we note the shareholders' report? Um, raise your hands if you're okay with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, John. Um, the revenue budget monitoring report. OK, um, this basically is a report that takes us um, through the financial year, this year, um, which is through to March 2021. As you can see, uh, it lays out the details. Um, as you can see, as a council, we went into this pandemic uh, pretty well equipped, better than some of the other councils. We've got strong financial standing. And, and the medium term plan was agreed by the council in February. The council also holds non-general reserve, full reserves that are earmarked for specific expenditure that it may face. But at this moment in time, um, we are told that we are among, I think we were the 10th, had the best, uh, the best reserves in the country. But of course, what I've just said about COVID has a, has a marked effect on that. Has anybody got any questions? OK, so there's um, a, a recommendation the council notes the the council's strong financial standing leading up to the COVID crisis, as illustrated the executive sum summary as the executive uh, set out in the report, the significant financial impact of COVID-19 crisis that illustrated the overall forecast of the current position, the ongoing work to manage the budget and ensure financial viability and to approve the revenue implications of the capital borrowing of 288 for the purchase of, um, I'm, I don't know what to say now, we've always called, called them Hessian sacks, but uh, uh, the, the polypropylene sacks, which will have the effect of increasing recycling levels and generating a, a beneficial financial impact. Is it all those in favour to the recommendation? Could I ask a question, John? Yep. Sorry, I, it was about the polypropylene sacks, actually, or the, the ex-Hessian sacks. 
Um, I sent Parry quite a lot of questions um, from my residents about the details of the scheme. So I'm not talking about the principle, I'm talking about the details. And I'm just wondering if Parry would be able to answer those questions as part of the Q&A on the scheme. Um, yes, but not as part of this um, no, agenda. No, I, I recognise there's no time for it now, but I'd like to see the questions answered, please. Lovely. Um, so all those in favour of this, uh, these recommendations? Pauline? Uh, thank you very much. I think that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, John? Again. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you stole my thunder, actually, because the the Hessian or plastic sacks, call them what you want, they're actually in the capital monitoring report because they're being purchased via the capital budget. That's okay. what took you by surprise, John. They took me by surprise as well, Pauline, because I thought I'd missed something. OK, um, so, John. OK, oh. so. So this is capital monitoring report and basically what it does is it monitors uh, the or it lays out what we will be spending capital on. The change to this, um, as you will see, there is a number of projects that have been rephased. In fact, the projects that have been rephased uh, come to uh, about a hundred and 105 million pounds and there was a question which I will answer um, that was asked um, by Imogen, and she wanted to know where the details were. Well, if you look at page 64 of this report, you will find the details on that. So I hope that answers that question. OK, Thank are there any, any questions for anybody else? Uh, yeah, just one other comment, John, about the um, ex-Hessian sacks, whatever they're called about. Um, yeah. I think that the question from the resident about the recyclability of them is an interesting question. And um, I believe polypropylene is is recyclable so that would be useful to just mention that i also believe that they i believe they have rubber weights in and those rubber weights are also 100% recyclable and i'm told that the percentage of the bags are actually made of recyclable material um, that that has already been recycled so i'm not an expert on this because all i'm doing is supplying the money thanks john has anybody got any questions with regards to this? It should be obvious why we're deferring 104 million pounds worth, 105 million pounds worth of the capital programme, and that is because of the uncertainty going forward. These are not cancellations at this current uh, stage. They are basically um, they are basically deferrals. But also in the report is an additional 600,000 pounds, which was agreed to uh, develop a Dinton Pasture Activity Centre. That again is a, a resident, something the residents like an awful lot. And so that's that will be going forward. Um, and I'd be asking for the permission for that as well. OK, could I um, uh run through the recommendations or could you read the recommendations because they're quite a lot yeah okay uh, i'll read the recommendation note that the council capital program to be reviewed throughout the year in the context of covid19 on funding sources service and service requirements and any changes will be presented to the executive for approval approve the proposed rephasing to part of the capital program following the in-year review including the compact to covid19 set out in Appendix B. Approve £600,000 additional budgeted funded to be borrowed for the Dinton Pasture Activity Centre for changes necess necessitated as an outcome of public consultation and planning requirements. The cost of borrowing is estimated at £27,000 per annum and will be covered from expected additional income generated by the new activity centre as set out in paragraph six of the executive summary of the report. Note a reduction in the school devo devolved formula grant budget in the capital programme of 302 due to the council receiving £87,000 less than originally budgeted as set out in paragraph four of the executive summary. Five, to approve the borrowing of 228,000 for the purchase of refuse reusable sacks, which will have the effect of increasing recycling level and generate a beneficial impact far in excess of the cost of borrowing, which is also set out in paragraph eight of the executive summary. In fact, there's a saving of around about 4, pounds, 400,000 pounds a year. 
to note that the consultants will be engaged within the existing budgets to review the noise level and the options with regards to the major resurfacing work as set out on the A33 out in paragraph 9 of, of the executive summary and to note the quarter one position for the capital budget as set out in appendix A to report as a summarised in, in the executive summary. <sighs> Woo. Thank you. Can we have approval of that uh, quickly so I can move on because we're short of time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and moving on um, to the Treasury management outturn. Uh, could you just Ex highlight that? Excuse me, Chairman. I have problems hearing. Uh, the, the voices come and go. Am I the only one with this problem? It certainly are. Uh, from my point of view, I can hear everybody, everybody it's well. Fine. Perfect. It's fine, my end. I Tre can hear Likewise. you, John. I had a problem with uh, Councillor Kaiser. We've got um, uh, 20 minutes to get through all these items, so let's uh, quickly carry on to the, the Treasury Management outturn, uh, page 65. I mean, this is basically to demonstrate the council's treasury function has effectively managed the council's debt and cash balances to support the funding of the delivery of the council's key priority. And you asked tonight as the executive to, um, the, this is recommended to council and note the report was presented to the audit committee on the 29th of July. Note that the, note that the managed repayments of debt over time, which illustrates the increased borrowing required to fund the key council priorities, which in turn generates income streams to pay to repay debt and provide revenue funding for vital statutory services as set out in the graph. Note that the asset value created through the council capital investment compared to the debt required to generate the asset value as set out in the graph in table, in table two of the report and note the capital investment made in the council's priorities for its community by category as set out in table one of the report. Note that the treasury management report in Appendix A that shows that all approved indicators have been adhered to and that prudent and safe management has been adhered to. Okay, could could we um, vote on that unless there's any questions? Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, right, moving on. Um, the pages 81 to 100 have the uh, Wokium Outco break control plan summary. Uh, the document itself is very much weightier. Uh, the executive is, is just asked to note it and be aware of it um, as we might have to implement it. The implementation would take place in uh, a body which is the outbreak control board, um, which is a um, a subsector of the um, uh, the health and wellbeing board. Um, so I'm just asking you to note the re the, the recommendation that the note the um, uh, plan. Uh, everybody happy with that? Could you just put put up your hands to note him? Thank you very much. Moving on um, to the Central and Eastern Berkshire Joint Mineral Plan, Waste Plan, Duty Corporate, and could you take them together? 101 and 173. Huge, weighty documents. Yeah. And I, I'm really pleased that we're not printing documents anymore because everybody would be unhappy about the trees which would go on them. Wayne. Yes. So we take items. 11 and 12 obviously the first one as it's stated is our cooperation and statements of common ground we have trailed the minerals and waste plan for quite some time over a number of years we have consulted widely and if anybody in the borough wants an example of how we listen to our residents this is probably the greatest one because we've taken out virtually or, well, we have taken out every site that was put forward and sites that were were put forward that had to have virtually no due diligence done on them. Um, so 
I'm expecting everybody to be quite happy with this document. The only thing I will say is the reason why we need these statements of common grounds, because we will be relying on our neighbours across all authorities to buy our raw, raw products, our raw materials for building and um, roads and networks, etc. So as you can see, the recommendation on agenda item 11 is that we approve the statements of common ground. Um, and then you've got the agreed to delegate of authority, as you know, normally happens in these things, and to allow minor changes. Do you want to take these in order, John? So do we want to do those first? And just sure. to yep. If there's any questions, or can we go to the acceptance? Everybody in favour? Everybody happy about that? Raise your hands. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, move on, Wayne. Yeah, okay. So if we now go to page 173, everybody okay with that? So this is part two of the document. This is the actual minerals and waste plan. And as I've said, we've consulted widely on this plan for a number of time, for a number of years. We've taken out the items. Um, and this is basically, but we obviously need a plan, and this is the plan, and the recommendation, as you can see, we're going to take this to special council after this meeting, but it's to approve the plan, authorise the community engagement that will start on Thursday the 3rd of September for six weeks, and, and then obviously that will take us to Regulation 22 and the various other items that when it gets to the inspector level. But as I said, I'll go back to my point. There should be no items of contention in this document because we have taken out the waste and mineral sites and we will be relying on our neighbours. So unless we've got any questions, I suggest we go to the vote, John. Any questions? What's the recommendation? The recommendation is that it's we approve... Yeah. Sorry. As, as set out on page yes. one and three, um, I don't think you need to read it. It's uh, to approve the um, draft waste management plan proposed submission. Yeah. Um, all those in favour? Put your hands up, please. Lovely. Thank you very much, Gregor. You now have got ten minutes. Uh, thank you, John. Um, this this paper asks the executive to approve an additional capital budget of £483,900 to finance two climate emergency projects. The first is for the provision of altered hot water systems, uh, high air source heat pumps, increased natural ventilation and the installation of solar panels both on the roof and in the car park at Dinton Pastures Activity Centre. Dinton Pastures is a flagship leisure and environment site for our borough, and this investment will also make this a flagship site for our climate emergency. This program will actually reduce and offset carbon at the site that this facility will become energy positive, meaning that it will generate 126% more energy than it uses and will take 30% more carbon from our environment than it produces. This is the first in the borough within the council's portfolio of community assets and a real example of best practice that we will be looking to repeat elsewhere in the coming months and years. This investment will also pay to add roof mounted solar panels to the Addington School new build. Unfortunately, the design process was too far down the road and build deadlines too close to add additional climate emergency infrastructure at this phase. This investment will still cut carbon emissions by 49.7% and improve energy efficiency versus the original plan by 46%. I request that the executive adopt the recommendations as set out on page 401. Thank you. Any questions? You can actually ask questions on this time because we've got caught up a little bit. Could I... There is some doubt on our carbon emergency plan, Gregor. Could could I just get you to restate what we're trying to do by 2030? That um, our uh, council motion was to do what we the what we could to um, by endeavours, by um, promotion, and to 
carbon neutrality to 2030, we accepted in that motion that we would not be doing it on our own. Is that right? Uh, yes, John, that's that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, we we committed in our motion to play as active role as possible in cl fighting climate change um, with the objective of reaching carbon neutral by 2030, if possible. Um, that is what our action plan is set out to do. We've set out to build a plan that will take us to carbon neutral. Um, as I said in council last week, we have a, a shortfall to that carbon neutrality at the moment, but we have enough other initiatives that we're working on in the background at the moment um, and other plans that, that we, we think may come to fruition, that we will be able to close that gap. But you're absolutely right. We are reliant on other people. We're reliant on people like Highways England and Southwest Trains and Reading Buses. We're reliant on central government. We're reliant on the energy companies to play their bit. But if you look at the, the historical data, a lot of those organisations and a lot of those people that we're reliant on have already stepped up to the mark. You know, despite having more houses in our borough over the last 10 years, the amount of energy that we are using is coming down. The amount of carbon that it is producing, I should have said, is coming down. And that's absolutely fantastic. And that's a testament to the work that people like SSE and the other energy companies are doing on our behalf. But we have to play a role as well. And things like this Dinton Pastures Activity Centre shows to our residents, it shows to our potential partners for the future and anybody that wants to work with us that we're taking this seriously, that we have high aspirations and where possible, you know, with the example of Dinton, it's going to be 130% carbon neutral. It's going to take 30% more carbon out of the atmosphere than it puts in. That is a stake in the ground to anybody that wants to work with us to say, we're taking this seriously, you need to too, and here are the conditions under which we're prepared to work with you. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I take this to the vote? The recommendation on page four, 401. Thank you. And, um, and thank you. That's that ends our business. Before we go, I'd like to wish everybody a, a very good summer. Uh, I remind you of what I said before, that coronavirus is still a very real threat and danger. We will be working uh, throughout the summer um, to ensure that our residents are safe. Um, we will be ensuring that their social distancing and um, if there is a necessity for a local lockdown, we, we will be managing a local lockdown. So please with all your interlocutors and, and, and any other um, political activities are going, remember that we're still very much in the middle of the emergency. We're still at the same situation that we were before and we will still be looking after the vulnerable, but we will start to look at what we need to do to balance the budget for this year and the years to come. take place. Stay safe, have a really nice summer and my apologies again to the five people who didn't get their questions answered um, but we do need to go to a special council executive. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.